Thanks for being patient. Here are the nuggets. The stuff that I love to talk about, the juicy bits around the edge of the maps that I talk about first. It was too long to put these all into one video. Um, just so much to talk about today, as there seems to be every day. So apologies for that. But here it is, uh, a little bit later than the map stuff. Uh, I hope that's okay for you. Thanks for being patient. Okay, first nugget, let's talk conscription. So here's an example of, of what's been happening in occupied areas. So the big mobilization, apparently as many will Russians say, in, in this short amount of time, as many as 200,000 troops have already been mobilized. Whether that's entirely true is debatable, uh, but we also have the issue of the quality of these troops and the morale of these troops, so on and so forth. <laughs> So here we have uh, just a bus I in, in uh, Luhansk that just t turns up and they it's like Victorian Britain and press ganging um, naval, you know, potential naval um, conscripts by, you know, walking around Portsmouth and just getting people really drunk, knocking on the, on the head. And then two days later, they're on a boat uh, in the Solent. Oh, there you go. Um, that that's what happens. So buses go around force force conscripting people, um, or or dragging people on, or or enticing people on. However, it's done. Then you get this situation. Okay, now we've got the conscripts here. We're starting to get loads of video evidence that things are not looking good. In fact, there's the Russian human rights organization has admitted that at least six people have died in training already. Um, I don't sound like many, but you know, if six people had died in in a few weeks in UK military training, well, this would be a national uproar. Of course, this is Russia at the time of war, so things are different. Um, but here we have mobilised troops in the Omsk region. This is TASS reporting this in, in, in Moscow are electing a spokesman to complain about conditions and lack of pay. Uh, these are literally acts of mutiny and don't bode well for the combat performance of Putin's newest troops. Uh, that's all in Russian, so I won't go through it. But but there, the Russians are reporting themselves. So this guy is being elected and he's moaning about like everything being rubbish. Then you have a Russian Mobik, so mobilized uh, troops, location unspecified, recording an address to the public saying they were abandoned. They are all sick. They were given weapons which are not registered anywhere. They have to buy their food, uh, their own food, and they are mentally there are mentally unstable people among them. Um, so. Никакой комиссии не было нигде, блядь. На очереди. В первый день, как только мы приехали сюда, мы жили на улице. И во второй день 90% людей, которые находятся здесь, больны. Ни одно оружие не вписано ни на одного человека. Автоматы списаны со склада, нигде не числятся. Вооружение 70-х, 80-х годов. So, I mean, this is incredible, absolutely incredible. Not only are they moaning that people are literally uh, medically sick, but also mentally unstable. They are claiming they don't have enough guns. They all held up their guns there. And what, I don't know, maybe one in three people have guns. They're not registered. They're old guns from the 70s and 80s. Um, they don't have ammunition. Someone said, this is my ammunition. I found it outside. Uh, just, uh, they are really not happy. Helmets can be bent with a finger. 
They don't have helmets, they don't have armor. And they're saying, put it on Telegram. Uh, it just that's absolutely shocking. Uh, and again, the story sounds unbelievable. Russian draftees were simply left on their own at a train station in the Bel- Belgorod Oblast without being subordinated to any military unit. So Belgorod is in uh, is an oblast in Russia. They say that they were given full gear and live ammunition and that they had no training. So they've been given some guns, and which is nice, and full gear. So that's more than the, the other guys had. But then they're just left in Belgorod train station with no directions of what they're what they're doing. Uh, and again, this this video is is, is more like, proof of that. <laughs> so they, that, in, in fact, that this is the same bunch uh, of, of as the others. So there are around fifty of uh, fifty of us with weapons. Um, but at the same time, we're not subordinated to any military unit. Okay, so the same guys complaining about the same thing. So that actually that previous video was in Belgorod Oblast, and here they are, you know, someone else making those same claims. So although this this tweet is actually slightly incorrect because they haven't been given full gear, they've just been moaning that they don't have full gear. They do have some live ammunition, but not that many guns. And they're just, yeah, left in the train station. So, uh, and then Mark Hurtling, who I've, I've uh, referred to you before, the military, um, I think it's former commander, uh, US Army. So interestingly, Russian state TV now claiming it will take two months to get recently mobilized to the front lines in Ukraine. Great. But will they be able to do anything? No friggin' way. Uh, Ru- Russian forces may be able to train the basic of soldiering in two months, but you can't train combined arms warfare especially for large formations, in two months. You can't teach generals, colonels, and new sergeants, attendants, and leadership in two months. You can't fix a supply system that has been plagued with corruption for years in two months. You can't coordinate tankers, infantry, artillery, intelligence, engineers, air forces, and others for battlefield operations in two months. You can't counter-distrust soldiers uh, having Russian government uh, in two months. You... um, after 60,000 dead soldiers, you can't reverse a loss felt by Russian mothers and wives. You can't issue equipment, uniforms, ammo, food, supplies, spare parts that aren't there. Sanctions do work in two months. You can't won't offer advice to a president who doesn't listen and who kills those who offer contrarian recommendations in two months. There are more, but suffice to say, any Russian state TV commentator or pundit who is saying things will get, be better in the winter in just two months needs to remember just one thing. You can't change culture in two months. Doing that takes years, even decades. Putin will keep losing. So the Ukrainians have been trained with NATO doctrine and uh, armed force training since 2014. That's eight years. They are doing a pretty good job, but they're still not there. There is still massive corruption in in Ukraine, right? You can't change culture. I mean, that's taken, you know, eight years to maybe improve a bit, but it's an ongoing process. And now Russia expecting to solve things within two months. It's just not going to happen. Right. Another nugget. Sorry, this this is going to be a really long video. Burn rate. BBC's Russian language service reports as much as 75% of Russia's elite GRU, the military intelligence, third guard Spetsnaz brigade were killed. Actually, I think it's a reconnaissance uh, section of that. Wounded or missing during fighting in Liman. They were considered among the best of of Russian army's uh, special forces. So it's in, it's in, this is their Russian news service and I can't get the translation. I can get it on my phone, but not on the website. It doesn't offer it on the website, oddly. But The Guardian is reporting that this um, in in what's a pretty decent update. Attempts to play down retreats in Ukraine no longer wash inside Russia. Um, the Russian army has sought to play down Saturday's retreat from Liman as a minor military setback uh, during which it inflicted heavy casualties on Ukrainian troops in the fight for the city. Of course they claim that. But according to an investigation by BBC News Russia, one of Russia's most elite military intelligence units suffered high casualties during the retreat. Can I just do a bit of a sidebar here? So at the moment, with the Conservative government in in the UK, and they generally hate the BBC because it's a national entity and they they want everything to be uh, run by private corporations and private entities. So they want to stop the uh, taxpayer paying uh, licence fees for the BBC so that it it, it becomes privatised, right? But people... 
people like that or people who support that don't understand the incredibly important thing the BBC, and I know this from living abroad uh, and quite a lot of my life, uh, the incredibly important stuff the BBC do, does, both in terms of internal education in our own country and supporting education of our children, but also by doing an awful lot of soft power around the world. The BBC World Service is massively important and that was going to be cut hugely and I think it has been sort of combined with other parts of the BBC, but it does such an important job. Here, the BBC Russian News, as elsewhere in the world, is producing news in Russian, right, uh, or in, in local languages that worked to do an awful lot of, basically, you can call it propaganda. Oh, it is, is offering me English now. This this is is presenting news that Russians can read um, but is giving a point of view that is uh, like a Western British point of view as opposed to the Russian propaganda. And this is a kind of stuff that would never happen if the BBC was privatised. This just wouldn't... They would close down the BBC World Service because it's costing them. They would close down this. But this is um, doing the job of basically... UK intelligence to some degree in a very useful way. Anyway, that's me getting off my soapbox. Sorry about that. Um, and it continues, the Guardian article continues, the latest military failures seemingly too big to ignore have also spilled onto Russian television screens. Why do we advance meter by meter when they advance village by village? Olga Skabayeva, the country's top state TV host, angrily asked Andrei Marochko, a Russian-appointed official in Luhansk in a recent broadcast. We are now starting to see... Uh, the lies and disinformation of the Russian state um, be disproved by the facts on the ground. This leads me to my own article I wrote yesterday. Please check this out on Only Sky. I'll put a link below. Can Putin, locked in a bubble of bad intel, spin his way out of disaster? And this is talking about how truth eventually wins out. So when when you get a web of deception and lies and disinformation and misinformation, and you get this, like information bubble that russia exists in eventually when it gets so far distorted from reality that when reality hits the fall is even bigger and now russians are starting to realize holy crap we are doing really badly what is going on we were on un the understanding that we're doing really well and then i talk about how that kind of happens and this happens in the military from the bottom up so and, and the corruption they pay people to take them on take troops on training exercises but they pocket the money just give the people food and then show pictures of the training of another training exercise they, they've been on training exercise they say oh we've just uh, reached this town and then the next person up say we reached this town uh we took it and we inflicted te 10 tanks worth of damage on the ukrainians and we've only had limited losses and then that goes and it gets you know inflated as it goes up and up and up and so by the time it gets to someone like putin or shoigu You've got this situation where they, they just don't have a grasp on reality at the top. But then when you've got a top-down decision-making hierarchy, they are making decisions based on woefully inadequate and poor information. So they make bad decisions. This is why they invaded in the first place. So Putin just had bad information. It was like, Ukrainians are going to welcome us with open arms. And that's what they literally told the soldiers. Bunches of flowers, they welcome you. They invade, they, they invade Ukraine and Ukraine are like, get out of our country. We hate you. That disconnect uh, between what they think is true and actual reality has meant that they make incredibly bad decisions. And they have been doing like That's what underwrote their actual decision to invade. And then there's an underwritten every single bad decision since then. And you put that together with corruption and, and with people not relaying correct losses on the battlefield. And you get um, Russian state media parroting nonsense and rubbish and, and propaganda. You just get this disconnect from reality. Anyway, that's what I talk about in this article. Uh, please go and check that out. Can Putin locked in a bubble of bad intel spin his way out of a out of disaster? This is then supported by loads of stuff that's coming out now. Like this is, we need to stop lying. Uh, we have talked about this many times, but somehow the message never reaches individual leaders. Uh, Putin. So Russian general Andrei Kartapolov addresses a culture of deceit within Russia's defense ministry that is crippling Putin's Ukraine invasion. Absolutely, one hundred percent agree. 
Um, and then just people down below saying it's ingrown into their culture in general, not only in the army, lies and corruption over 80 years, almost terror and purges. And with the elite stealing everything, it won't change overnight. This is what Hartland was saying. This takes years to change. Former USSR states spent decades weeding this out, uh, now having NATO standards. The issue is bigger than it seems. Lies and deceit are deeply rooted in Russian culture. This is not just a problem affecting the army, but an entire country. Generals lie to minister that lies to Putin, who is a liar himself and is used to lie to a country of liars it's a spiral it's exactly the kind of stuff i'm i'm talking about here right uh, so really interesting um and and then you've got uh, the liman person in in charge of the liman disaster there's dissatisfaction about colonel general gennady zidko being reappointed to command russia's eastern military district one telegram writer complains he and others created quote a wall of lies a sea of blood and a swamp of corpses um and and so this is now coming out in the open you've got people on telegram russian sort of military bloggers and nationalists saying all these lies uh, and and we're still appointing this this guy to the eastern military district i mean they're starting to realize how how problematic um their entire structure is i've talked for almost 40 minutes and i haven't gone on to most of my uh nuggets okay quickly super quick uh iranian missiles so uh, fired at a town in, in the kiev region so uh cats these aren't missiles they're kamikaze drones um so these are still a problem the kamikaze drones that they've got from iran uh, because they're running out of their own tools to use. They are using these Iranian ones. They are still causing an issue. Here is a fascinating thing to watch. This is uh, a surrender of a of a vehicle, of an infantry fighting vehicle. Now, to me, I, I want to know what your opinion is, because I think this almost looks staged. But, I mean, you've got all these guys waiting for this vehicle to come along. They don't blow it up straight away. But it might have been prearranged, so they could have been on radio. They're saying we are going to, uh, we are going to surrender. Please don't shoot us, and then they come out. So six fifty fifty here. Don't know, but either way, it's you know interesting. Is this being used as propaganda to be given to the Russians to to incite them to do this, or is this a genuine piece of uh, surrender? Sorry, that's just a lot of not not seeing anything. And here we have the infantry fighting vehicle with its white flag. So it hasn't actually stopped yet, so they must be a little bit worried about that. Everyone's come poking up, and now it stops. I mean, uh, whether this is staged or not, uh, I don't. I don't know. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt, and it's not. This is genuinely what happened. It's just amazing that this this kind of footage is available for us to find online, to see online, and to get an understanding of how it works. I mean, this is just a social media war. It's absolutely unbelievable. So they all get out, and then they get, uh, you know... So, uh, but one thing to note, always, when you see Ukrainian soldiers, look at the gear they are in. It's almost always far superior. Just look at everything that's packed on these guys. These guys are loaded with quality gear. This is a super important point. They're loaded with quality gear, decent weapons, decent armor, decent helmets, uh, tech, um, knee pads, camo, everything, stuff, or med kits. They've got it all because they are being uh, provided decent stuff by, by the West. Uh, and Russia just the Russian troops don't have that. Um, uh, I won't go that. Don't have time. Uh, so here's another insight into war. Check this out.
So that looked like an ambush, uh, and they're out of the vehicle, and it, that's pretty ineffectual fire, but you could argue that's suppressing uh, fire to to suppress the enemy and keep their heads down, uh, give them a chance to sort of work out what's going on. But it's just absolutely amazing, isn't it, that, that, that they caught that. And actually, that's quite rare for the Ukrainians to allow something like that to come out, but, you know, it, does, it shows them sort of being okay at the end. Um, this is, again, amazing footage. So these are Humvees driving in, uh, uh, being, you know, having artillery or, or mortars or something, you, you know, hitting near them. You can see one Humvee is taken out that they drive past. <laughs> So uh, there you go. That's pretty incredible. And uh, then on to um, this one uh, next, which is just seeing the destruction in Kherson. Uh, looking at at just the convoy of Russian vehicles taken. APCs, tanks, armor, per, um, infantry fighting vehicles, just a lot. Just uh, pretty incredible. I mean, the, the amount of equipment the Russians have lost just on that short bit of road, phenomenal. And uh, uh, they are losing equipment. So when I talk about them being concentrated and being able to defend better, they are also losing a lot of equipment. Okay, let's have a little look at Ukraine weapons tracker. This is talking about one Russian D20, 152 mil uh, towed howitzer was destroyed and another one captured by the Ukrainian army in the east. Nothing special about that. When you look at these, you think, God, oh, that's an old bit of kit, isn't it? Look at that. Jeez, looked like it came out of the Second World War. The Look at the rust on that. Look at uh, It looks terrible. Well, the D20s are from the 1950s. I mean, this is... But on the one hand... You think, God, this is just really poor quality, poor quality tech, poor quality armaments the Russians are using. But then on the other hand, if their doctrine is to just blitz a town until it's flattened, it doesn't really matter whether you're using a D20 or another piece of artillery. It's going to do at least a short range, decent enough job on, on a target. You might not get the accuracy and, and the range you'll get on newer pieces, but it, it, it will be doing the job. However, it is quite reflective of where the Russian uh, equipment resources are at. Those D20s are not the newest. Uh, last, basically, last two nuggets. Goodness, massively long. Right, I talked about nuclear weapons being used, uh, nuclear weapons being used on the uh, Ukrainian in the Ukrainian war, it's interesting to think: Will China be supportive of what Russia are doing? Will they be supportive of the use of tactical nukes? One thing to to note, and this was made clear by someone in the comments, so I do read the comments. Uh, why does China own so much of Ukraine? So a few years back, they bought ten percent of Ukraine's arable land. So this is Ukraine is a breadbasket of the world, arguably, or one of the breadbaskets of the world. China owned ten percent of the arable land. Wow! So if they're going to use nuclear weaponry on that land, you won't be able to grow crops. End of. So China have a vested interest in Ukraine. So that's interesting. They have a vested interest in the success of Ukrainian farming. Um, not only do they eat it themselves, but obviously they then they're not just the consumers; they are effectively the producers. 
this so this is very uh, very interesting and you know china is is really on in the sights of the us at the moment and has been for some time so foreign policy is very much more about china than russia in some important way so over the past few years chinese buyers have bought farmland in countries ranging from the us and france to vietnam in 2013 hong kong based food giant wh group bought smithfield america's largest pork producer and more than 146,000 acres of missouri farmland in the same year xinjiang Pro- production and construction Corps bought nine percent of uk ukraine's famously fertile farmland equal to five percent of the country's total territory with a 50-year lease um in 2020, the US imposed sanctions on the Chinese company over human rights abuses. Between 2011 and 20, China bought nearly 7 million hectares of farmland around the world. Firms from the UK bought nearly 2 million hectares, while US and Japanese firms bought less than a million hectares. So, first of all, China are doing the biggest job there. Interestingly, the UK is involved in that. Um, this is obviously the way of Food is the future. If we don't have food, we don't exist. So it's all about food and water. The next 50 years are going to be about food and water. So buying up huge amounts of land to control food and water is strategically very important. Okay, the other argument about that um, Russia using nuclear nuclear, uh, weapons being a bad idea is that the prevailing winds in, in Ukraine are going to throw radiation out into into russia arguably here's some prevailing winds and actually it's a bit so someone said prevailing winds in ukraine are west to east they are they no east no, yeah west to east which means they're westerly winds actually they're not they so the westerly winds over here southerly over here east southeasterly over here uh northeasterly over here so it's the winds are from where they come from uh but up here there's some there's some um, easterly winds, which will which will hit uh, Russia if you had nuclear fallout around this region, not so much down south. So anyway, that's just an interesting consideration. So where they do use nuclear warheads, might if they do, it might be dictated by where the prevailing winds are. Finally, Shoigu, the defence minister, could be on his way out. Preparing the ground for the dismissal of Shoigu. That's an interesting bit of news and has probably long been in the making. He, he's, he's been sidelined more and more as time has gone on. In fact, Putin himself has, has positioned himself as a decision maker for the military, um, which, again, is pretty reflective of the trouble that Russia are in. That is a, a record-breaking video for me. Sorry, 50 minutes, way too much to talk about. Uh, and not all of it on the front lines, uh, most of it not. Um, sorry about that, but sorry, not sorry, is what I do, and probably why you're here. And if if you don't like that, you would have turned off already, and you're not listening to this, so it doesn't really matter. Anyway, uh, remember, you can always put me on double speed or 1.75. Uh, that's how I prefer to listen to other people. And when I li- listen to back to my own videos, sometimes to just make sure things are fine, I always put myself on 1.5 to 1.75, and I do sound a lot better. Those pauses in between when I say things and my stumbling over words is taken out by that and it just seems seamless and you get a lot more done with your day anyway check out this article please and i have uh, loads of articles on the ukraine conflict so if you go down the bottom i think there are somewhere at the bottom there are there is there are um keywords that are used i don't know where they are somewhere on this article there should be keywords somewhere so if you go and check out other articles that involve ukraine um uh, here we go so those are all the keywords I've used in there. So the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Ukraine, blah, blah, blah. You can check out other articles, certainly on the whole website and others from myself. Um, please do that. Please like, subscribe, share. Thanks for all your support. Thanks for everything. The conversations are brilliant down in the, in the comment sections. The uh, YouTube comments are, are so often terrible. It's just a horrible place to hang out. But actually, the conversations that have been going on on my recent videos have been really, really interesting. So kudos to you guys. Hats off. Props to to you guys for intelligently commenting with respect and courtesy, uh, swapping ideas, disagreeing with me quite a lot, often, uh, and sometimes agreeing. That's nice. But it's good to to be disagreed with because then how else do you do we change our um opinions so that they become more and more accurate the whole process for me is 
getting my understanding of reality improved all the time. So I may say things, but I don't, I can't improve if people don't disagree with me. And it's up to me to take on that and react to that and, and be um, humble enough to say I was wrong. I need to change my opinion on that. I was I made an incorrect claim there and this is why it's incorrect. So hopefully I'm doing that, uh, but you'll let me know if I don't. Uh, anyway, thanks. See you tomorrow.